Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined all the way from Brisbane in Australia, Nina Sunday. How are you doing, Nina? Really well, thank you, John. Delighted to be here. <laughs> yeah. and, and Nina just actually informed me, I didn't realize this, the 2032 Olympics are going to be held in Brisbane. So you're all going to be getting very familiar with Brisbane in, a, in the not too distant future. That's exactly right. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. And Nina is a conference speaker and an author, certified uh, visual pre virtual presenter, C network advisor, and publisher of the book Workplace Wisdom for Nine to Thrive. And what we're going to talk about today is this concept of high performing teams, like leading from the front and how you can lead from the front, but create the psycho an atmosphere of psychological safety so everybody can come along with you so um nina let's let's jump into it immediately and just uh, explain to me how the concept of what you consider like leading from the front what does that actually mean because some people would just say oh it's just like grabbing it and charge saying follow me and charging ahead <laughs> well here's the thing at one point my business expanded to the point where i had eight plus uh office staff right and of course i had only role modeled the managers that had that had uh managed me when i was uh when i was employed so mm -hmm. in many respects leadership and management had improved over the years but also it was a bit of the blind leading the blind because right. i didn't understand that you have to focus on culture if you want good results and so leading from the front there was this uh television program Rabbi Shmuley called uh, Sh Sh Shalom in the Home. And it was just a little program where he sat in a caravan and had a, a CCTV uh, of family interactions. And the one thing he, he described to this uh, parent was, you know, when your sons uh, walk past and you were reaching into the fridge and sort of your head was buried in getting something, you sort of turned around and said, now make sure you go out and do and, and just in, commanded them to do something. What you really need to do, that's leading from the side. What you really need to do is to close the door, lead from the front, ask them to sit down and have a conversation. I heard that. This is years ago. We're talking 15 years ago. And I went, I think I do that. I think people will say to me uh, as I'm walking past their desk, Nina, I've got a good idea, blah, blah. And I'll say, oh, no, I don't think that'll work. <laughs> that is death to culture. Yeah. See, one of the reasons I'm so big on culture these days is because I made all the mistakes and now I've learned from them over the years. <laughs> Thank goodness I still have a business and I still have a smaller team, but I still have a team. And we 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 work differently. We start with a we start the morning with a a, a quick uh, catch up that also includes how you're doing, finding out a little bit about them. And if they do have a good idea, I actually stop and think about it and I'm I'm gonna fess up. About a week ago, we were right in the middle of create, <coughs> creating some new product, a digital product, and my my assistant said, oh, what's the 80-20 rule? And I really just blurted out a really impatient definition. I went, I actually apologized later and right. I said, I'm sorry. When you asked, that was a really good question to ask and I really should have stopped and explained it properly to you. And here's the explanation. <laughs> So we, we we get caught out. I, even myself, as a as an expert in the area, sometimes I'm human too. Yeah, yeah. We're, no, it's 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 a it's a good point though because uh, it's it's very easy to fall into fall into these habits and maybe be unconscious in what we're doing. So I think because sometimes I feel, you know, when people hear this thing about you know you got to get culture right, sometimes they think, oh, that means I have to make everything fluffy and blah blah. blah. But I mean, culture can be what you want it to be as long as people understand that culture and sign on to that culture or sign out of it. Uh, maybe if that's not, but you have to, you have to, you have to establish what it is because most cultures come about organically and they just turn out to be probably a reflection of the the leadership. That's right, because I, when I was growing my business, I really thought that we had to focus on results. So our meetings were all about, uh, with the sales team at least, you know, who are your clients and, and, and who's going to convert and 
there was nothing about really about process and really about like for example are you having conversations with clients asking them questions about how they want their training uh more bespoke were they communicating that to me i discovered mm -hmm. that they didn't they just thought it was a sales process to say yes 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 i nearly right. fell through the floor when i found out one client said salesperson said yes 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 and we didn't get any of that <laughs> <laughs> well that's my job is to make sure that i communicate that sense of we're here to give what clients want and if they ask for things we bend over backwards to give it to them but to give it to them you've got to communicate it to me first and then maybe right. ask questions is it ha what has been happening in your conversations so not about what are your results and who are you going to who are you going to convert and what what you know what's uh, are you going to achieve target this month it's it's really stepping back and realizing that profitability follows purpose and if people get a sense that you're building their capability and that they're making progress as a as a participant as an individual contributor to the business they're going to have greater loyalty Mm -hmm. And and you know, part of this too is I mean being conscious as you said I love that I love that uh, story you told about the fridge uh, because no it's it's a great it's a great metaphor for things because it's it's like but the world we live in today or we're we've had our, we have our head in fridges nonstop we have our phones popping up we have alerts we have texts coming we have this we have that we we don't focus and I think the idea of focusing on and actually paying attention to what's being said as you said in your example when the person asked the 80 20 we were like stopping this is almost counterculture right now we have to reintroduce this idea of actually listening and focusing and being in the moment because let's face it how many times have you had a conversation with somebody where they've no problem suddenly glancing down at the text that came on and then kind of glancing back up uh, and they don't think it's rude they don't think it's rude yeah that's the mistake it is rude <laughs> yeah <laughs> unless you say you know, there's an important thing. I've got a child in hospital or, yeah. you know, yeah, I'm sure, waiting sure. Here, unless you sort of set that up ahead of time, mm -hmm. I'm actually waiting for something really important. Yeah, it is It is rude. You need to have the, that focus. And that's what's interesting about my phone. The, the, the do not disturb is actually under the tab focus. So uh, it helps us think that the power of focus helps us get more things done. And just going back to that little uh, example I gave a minute ago, all I had to do was say, that's a really good question. We're just in the middle of this right now. Can we take time, uh, you know, mm -hmm. in an hour or two, and I'll tell you all about it. And be patient. Mm -hmm. It's when you are impatient, and that comes across in the tone. It's like that question was an interruption. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I just, I felt I had to apologise because I'm trying to be the perfect boss. <laughs> you know, we have <laughs> always. But sometimes we get a bit impatient and... The, the 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 mistake is letting it come through in our tone of voice yeah and it's funny i mean i think the more you progress uh, you know as a leader or whatever it I, I actually think you can almost measure it by the more the more you're apologizing the better you're doing because you're catching yourself in things yes yes that's self-leadership and that's um uh managing yourself and managing your emotions and mm. uh just being aware that our the number one job of a leader is to build the capability i'm talking about middle managers as leadership yeah, yeah. you're building the capability of the people uh that you you are leading because you see unless you build their capability you can't if you're in a larger organization you can't promote uh be promoted to your next to your next level role mm -hmm. and that goes even if you're self-employed because i ended up having to create hierarchy as the business got bigger so any solopreneur can become a uh, have a larger organization and become an entrepreneur oh absolutely so t talk to me a little bit about this concept of psychological safety uh because i'm not sure everybody understands what that is yes now this came out of um a go I, I get quite fascinated by a couple of these studies by the google company from their people lab and they did Project Oxygen, which discovered the eight good behaviours of a manager. And one of them is making sure you have one-on-ones with people. And that's mm -hmm. something that I didn't do. It was a management consultant that fed me back. He did a 360 degree report, fed me back the info. And I went, oh, I didn't know any of this. And that's because I'm not talking mm -hmm. to them one-on-one, -on -one, only as a group. 
But then they had this other project called Project Aristotle, where they were trying to work out what were the qualities of an effective team. And I love research. I love evidence-based data. And what they did, because they've got access to all the data in the world sure. almost, yeah. um, they, their experts were looking at norms, you know, uh, do people, uh, are, are the best managers the ones that are educated in manage, management or they came up through the ranks? Are the best ones introverts or extroverts? Or the teams are a makeup of a mix or, or mainly extrovert, mainly introvert? Do they socialise outside of work? They worked out that none of those worked. And then they started looking at more under the surface stuff. And they came up with two qualities that, uh, com and they called it psychological safety. The two qualities that make the most effective team are social sensitivity, which is mm. reading people and reading the nonverbal cues and reacting to them, social sensitivity, and um, conversational equality. Because if you, it's up to a manager to look, to reflect, this is self-leadership, self-reflect mm -hmm. after a meeting and go, did, some, did only a couple of people do all the talking and were there a couple of people silent? Did, when, when one piece of news I announced, did everybody, what were the expressions on their faces? What, what did I pick up? Did, did anybody have a kind of a quizzical look or, or, a, or a, like they were rejecting the information but didn't say anything? And that's a cue to the manager to maybe have a one-on-one -on -one and not, not to do a, I was watching you, <laughs> <laughs> which is a bit rude, but to say, I, I couldn't help but notice, it's very softly, softly, I couldn't help but notice that uh, you, you, you reacted a little to that piece of information. Do you want to just share with me your thoughts around that? Because here's the thing, John, some of our deepest thinkers are the introverts Mm -hmm. that don't come forward, they're not assertive with their with their uh, opinion, and yet their opinion is gold. You just have to uh, uh, mine for it, pan pan for gold. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, ex no, ex exactly, one hundred percent, and that's uh, absolutely. And I think, I think that's, I think that's what we one of the biggest failings of of a lot of leaders or managers, middle managers or whatever, is just not that understanding that you that people operate differently and you're losing if you just listen to the you know the the gregarious among us um or the people who've always got an opinion um the more you do that the more you reinforce that yes these are the only people who really matter and you can stay quiet you know you have to bring it out of people and acknowledge that people people are different not everybody's going to speak up and it's easy to do. You can just make sure that after there's been a bit of uh, discussion and you're observing that, that mm -hmm. a couple of people are, are hogging the limelight, just then go around the room and say, oh, Mary, what do you think? Jack, what do you think? Uh, and, and just make sure that you draw out from everybody that has been silent what they're thinking about it. Now, they can choose to pass. They might. Sure. Oh, I, I want to still think about it. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Let people pass. But invite them for their opinion. I was at um, uh, one of these meetings after a big uh, professional development session and there was a, a, a young person there, maybe in his early 20s, and he just shared the opinion that it, we, we all did a particular game and a process and he said, oh, yeah, during that activity, oh, yeah, it was the desert survival uh, game where you had to list uh, the, the 15 items in a pr plane crash that in order of priority to actually get the group to survive. And he was saying, yes, when I was doing that simulation, I didn't say anything because everybody seemed to be so opinionated. I thought my, my ideas must be wrong. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> this is sometimes if people don't, lack a little bit of confidence, but yeah. their opinion is, counts just as much. I mean, it's people holding back what they really think, artificial harmony, holding back what they really think that put the VW company into trouble yes. when you might mm -hmm. have heard of Dieselgate, where yes. uh, the, the whoever it was in the organisation, including the top CEO, decided to put software in that would cheat the emissions yeah. testing, government emissions testing. I'm sh uh, the new CEO said there, was, there were too many project managers and engineers not speaking up and letting the yeah. others go yeah. forward with what really was a disaster for the company. But uh, yeah. they will come back. 
Yeah, no, that that's a and that's a really good example as well. It's it's it is it is so interesting because you end up then in this situation, right? Say it's say you have that that meeting and you know certain people talk up and then you go around, everybody's agreed, yeah, great. And then you put out a message, say, here's what we've agreed to the organization, and then the manager of one of those groups comes back and says, Yeah, I don't really agree with that. And then you've just everything has just been completely undermined because you didn't actually get consensus around the table. Yes. Well, the thing is, you you won't always get consensus. But no, I, cons well, you have to say we have to make a decision and we yeah. have to agree to disagree. Now, yes. it sounds to me like the right person wasn't in the room to put their two cents worth in. It's like that person who vetoed probably needs to think about process more. It's like you can't mm -hmm. just veto something that the group has actually decided. If you yeah. would participate in that didn't make yourself a participant. Um, yeah, and also I, I think not enough leaders are, are role modelling the best, and by that, listen to podcasts, read the books, attend the workshops, and just b keep building your own awareness about what works and, and, mm -hmm. and then, then self-observe your own behaviour because... I used to veto, and and we're talking twenty years ago. And I'm going. Right. I I demotivated people by doing that. I thought mm -hmm. motivation was taking them out to lunch on their birthday, right. you know, the, or the or, or or Christmas event. I I saw it as surface level socialising. Now yes. I realise that it really is making sure you have one on one conversations. I thought leading from the front was having group conversations. Mm -hmm. You've got to have one on ones as well. <laughs> yeah you know you know it's funny about what you just said there because that's i mean as you know in in the states and the whole like silicon valley thing that was um uh, you know the people used to think that oh culture keep people happy i'm gonna put in massage chairs and foosball tables and pool tables and all of this and everybody's like oh this is super and then about a month later like the the you know the massage chairs gathering dust nobody plays the foosball table nothing's happened because that's all superficial as you said at the end of the day people people want to be acknowledged right they want to be seen and heard well here's the thing i read that google put in lava lamps so i ordered lava lamps for the office but did i ask people if they wanted a lava lamp yeah. on their I can't believe myself. I look back and I go, at least I'm learning from from my past behaviour. <laughs> <Yeah, that's, laughs> I love that, but I mean, it's all, all done with the right intent. But but unfortunately, yeah. that is what that is what was sold as a bill of goods. I think over a, a period of time, it's like all these extra trappings and accoutrements. That's what people want, and and you think no. At the end of the day, pe as you said, people want to be seen and heard, and they want to feel like they're progressing. And, and feel respected. You know, one of the benefits of my podcast, Manage Self, Lead Others, which mm -hmm. is on self-leadership and leading people, I get to interview some of the best experts in the world. And I'm learning with every conversation, just as you and I are learning as well, sure. uh, this yeah. conversation. Um, I'm, I'm One of the best conversations I had <clears throat> was uh, early in the piece was um, with the Senior Vice President of Peach, <clears throat> People and Culture of the ACOR Global Hospitality Group. Mm -hmm. back or they do hotels yes sure yeah. yeah yeah no absolutely and they uh i read that they have this culture called hardest as in the heart ist hardest and i wanted to find out more about that because you don't hear about culture with heart very much mm -hmm. as it's certainly from a top level this is our this is the name of our culture and she said it just boils down to when we have a meeting not only is everybody the, 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 the culture is everybody arrives on time, but we arrive on time to chat about what's happening in our lives. And we give mm. full five or 10 minutes. That's what we do around here. And then we go to business because understanding a little bit about what's happening in people's lives. So you can actually be, what, a bit supportive. We don't want to have compassion fatigue with people that <laughs> just dump their problems, but it's appropriate um, sharing of the good news and the and the struggles so that we can, you know, just be a little bit supportive or celebratory of people's um, awards or special events or my, you know, uh, my cousin's getting married and I'm the bridesmaid or whatever it is, you know, mm -hmm. that's exciting in people's lives and we can support that. So it's it's a, that's one of the eight good behaviours that uh, the 
Project Oxygen discovered is that a good manager will know a little bit about the private life of the people they lead and not think that that has nothing to do with work. It's, it's, a, it's a, an appropriate understanding of yeah. the backstory, basically. I mean, it's, actors talk about having a backstory when they uh, learn mm-hmm. lives. Um, the manager has to understand the, a little bit about the backstory of the people in their immediate um, team, their direct reports. Yeah, you know, and and it's and it's fascinating because I think that even has become accentuated during the COVID period, or maybe it revealed itself to people who'd never seen it before. About the fact is that now you're actually kind of forced to find out how people were because if they were being sent home, what their circumstances, so what was going on in their lives, suddenly became important to you, and also it actually impacted like you know maybe their setup, their work hours, all of this kind of thing. So it kind of forced people into doing that. And, and also, yeah, the work from home, I think it's it's here to stay even in a hybrid, you know, work from home, work yes, from office. Yes, absolutely. Because it's, it's more family friendly. It enables, yeah. say, oh, uh, someone has to go and pick up the kids from school. Yeah. That's what happens. You, you can then pick up the kids from school and then just, you know, do 5 to 7 p.m. You know, you don't yeah. have to be yeah. in the that little box of 9 to 5 or 8 to 4. So, yeah. Uh, I think I think it's cre- created greater flexibility. So there's something, there's a silver lining to COVID, and uh, I, I think we we can all appreciate that. Apart from you know the pain and suffering, there yeah. there has we've created more flexibility, and that's a good thing. Yeah, and it and it's just for me is like why if somebody if you can have somebody if your business allows and the the work allows it, but if you can have somebody live where they want to live, you can have them if if family is important to them and they can have breakfast with their kids and bring them to school and they're happier, they're more productive, right? So happy happy people are generally more productive than unhappy people. It just happens. I don't think we I don't think we need any science for that. I think that's uh, probably a given. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, listen, Nina, this has been fantastic. I mean, the time has flown by here. Um, oh, but be- yes, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah. But before we go, like all of Nina's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Yes. Well, uh, I am a cert- certified speaking professional, a CSP. So, and I've got a set up here at the office, a, a Zoom studio. So I can deliver conference presentations across the miles in any time zone. As well, I have a training company in, for anyone in Australia. I have trainers that turn up face to face and we do all the soft skills, not only leadership, but time management, customer service, business writing. And those are topics that I can deliver as a live online workshop as well. And speed reading. I started life as a speed reading instructor. and We wow. still have live online speed reading courses. Oh, and of course, 30 day challenges. That's good for anybody in any time zone. Uh, So get in touch with me if you want uh, a daily five minute micro lesson over 30 days in either leadership, time management, uh, customer service, business writing, and the, the list is growing. Yeah. And by the way, one thing I would just add to add for for people who are watching and listening is don't wait for your company to invest in you, right? Invest in yourself because at the end of the day, nobody cares as much about you as you do. And if you sit around saying, well, yeah, no, I'd like to improve as a, as a leader or manager, but you know, my company hasn't done any training. It's like, why wait? Go out and invest in yourself. Exactly. You've got to invest in yourself because, um, look, one of the things that, uh, the reason I'm self-employed is because my manager at ABC Television in Australia, which was the, uh, one of the main mm-hmm. channels, never said to me, now, Nina, what what's your goal? Where do you want to be in five years' time? And I would have said right. to her, I want to be an executive producer in charge of a department. No, she just hired me to do the job I was paid to do, which was pay the bills and do the schedule. Right. It's like I left because I could not see any future. You yeah. must find out what is the career goals and of, of the, your team. And even if they have big ambitions and you've got a small business and you can't see that you could fulfill it. Your task as a leader is to ensure that you build their capability so they can move on to their <laughs> next role and they will stay with you for longer. Uh, they'll mm. only stay with you for one or two years if you don't uh, give them a vision of the fact that they're growing or progressing, but they'll stay with you maybe for four years 
if mm. you if you give them that sense, that big picture sense of this is how you're growing, doing the job that you're doing. So that's mm. for those that might have a small business and go, well, I'm the leader. I don't can't really employ another leader. So uh, well, there is one way to people for longer. Yeah, because it was a great. Um, somebody once said, you know, you sometimes people go like, oh well, if I invest in you know training or helping, you know, then they'll get up and leave and go somewhere else. So we used to always say to them. Um, yeah, so sure, but what happens if you don't train your people and they stay? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Which which is better? Was get a profile, one of those profiles, disc profile, Myers Briggs. You must yeah. understand where just any any of these um, standard profiles will work, but understand the difference between people, and then you mm. assign tasks according to their capability. You also can predict how they're going to execute that task. If I want a quick answer, I don't give it to a high, high C and disc is, you know, detailed person. Yeah. You, uh, you give it yeah, to someone yeah. that is, like, looks for the shortcuts and just wants the quick answer like you <laughs> or vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, I totally agree. I mean, you just got to get away from this kind of one size fits all and realize that, you know, people have always been, you know, different, obviously, in individuals. But I think they're more comfortable in expressing that now. So you need to kind of react to that or they're more comfortable in going looking as you said maybe looking for a culture that fits their personality yeah yeah very yeah. good well if you're the manager you're the one that can actually uh, influence that culture so um the best book i can recommend uh that i really go back to time and time again is ray dalio's principles life and work right absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. A famous guy in the states a bit like warren warren buffett He's a bit of a Warren Buffett, but uh, his book is fabulous. Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, well, listen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, listen, thanks so much, Nina. Thank you for watching and listening. We'll see Nina in 2032 when we're all headed down to Brisbane uh, for the Olympics. <laughs> Come and say hi. Come and say hi. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, thank you. Thank you for watching and listening, and I'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, John. Lovely to, lovely to speak with you.